morning. It's a good thing when you get so used to your mask you don't even notice that you have it on. Uh, I'm so glad to see you. I hope you have come uh, in a spirit of worship and so much of a part of that is, is uh, preparing our hearts and nothing does that like singing and praying. But we'll sing first. So if you have your camp meeting songbook, we're going to sing I'll Fly Away. That's number 20, number 20, and we're going to sing the first verse and the third verse. And if you feel like clapping, just throw down your songbook and let's do that too. So if you'll stand to sing I'll Fly Away, verses 1 and 3, number 20 in your camp meeting book. Number three, number three, he keeps me singing. There's within my heart a melody. We'll sing verses one and five. Number three. you all love that one like we do. That's one of the songs that when, whenever I get to, sit, to choose the um, fifth Sunday night singing songs, this is one that everybody just, they don't even look in the book. They just look up and sing. It's, it's joyful. We're going to um, now sing number one in the book. I am thine, O Lord. And we're going to sing verses one and two. I am thine, O Lord. Number one.
Amen. You may be seated. Good singing. Good singing this morning on this third. This is our third camp meeting Sunday, I think, if I'm counting correctly. Great to see each of you here. Welcome. Uh, welcome if you're here in the sanctuary. If you've come to worship in person today, welcome if you're worshiping with us online. Uh, if you're joining in through the live stream, welcome if you're watching this later. Uh, if, if you say, I couldn't make it there at the church and I couldn't tune in at 11, if you're catching us later in the day or later in the week, welcome, because we all come together no matter how we do it. Our purpose in coming together is to worship a holy God. You know, I was thinking this morning as I was getting things ready, making sure I had my, my mask, which by the way, I've decided doubles pretty well as a pocket square. I'm going to market those. I'm going to market those. <laughs> But, uh, but I was thinking, you know, if, if Paul was writing today, if you go back and look at Ephesians chapter 6 and you see the familiar passages there where Paul is writing, encouraging the church at Ephesus, and he's saying to them, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the, the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the helmet of salvation. He's using things that were familiar to them at, at the time. He's describing that Roman soldier, that warrior. I wonder if he was writing that in our time, if he would say something like, put on the face covering three-ply N95 <laughs> mask of love. You know? Did you know in all that whole list of things, he, he, he doesn't identify anything with love? That whole list. So, so I thought we'd do that today. We'd identify this thing as aggravating as it can be sometimes with love because that's what you're doing as you wear this thank you for doing it as you wear this you're loving people around you you're saying thank you thank you uh, I love you and I care for you and I'm going to make sure that I do my part it is not fun but it's something that we do because we care for others a couple of announcements this morning things to bring to your attention you'll notice there in the little flyer insert that you got there that you picked up as you came in that was included in your camp meeting songbook couple of meetings coming up we're getting into meeting season uh, as our groups and our committees meet as we approach the fall uh, for charge conference carry on the things we have to do to carry on the business of the church staff parish relations committee will meet this tuesday at 5 30 in the social hall we've got a setup in there we've we've tested it once it worked pretty well we got to set up to keep everybody, uh, we're probably 10 or 12 feet apart, although we're in a configuration where we can actually do business. Committee on Nominations and Leadership Development, you're really only called on one time a year, and you may be questioning, am I on that? Am I on that committee? Uh, we're going to get you out a postcard to remind you that you're on it, uh, but we'll be meeting, that group will be meeting on the 25th at 5.30 there in the social hall. Usually at this time each year, as school is starting back, we all come together, and I ask you to bring school supplies, bring some things to uh, assist the students in our county, and we're going to do that again this year. Uh, we've got a little bit of a, a late start with all the, the things happening with COVID-19, but we're, we're going to try to reach out and meet that need. So what I want you to do is just stay tuned to our Church Family Facebook page. We'll put a list there. Uh, it's, not, it's not everything that we might ordinarily get. There's some things they're well stocked up on, so we don't want to waste any funds on those. But I'll put a list there on our church family Facebook page and uh, things that you could purchase when you're out. Drop by here at the church, bring them to worship. We'll have a collection point, or you can drop them by the office. Um, again, it's great to see you this morning. Great uh, to have you in this time of worship as we come together. Let's begin our time today as we pause and go before God's throne. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you that, uh, that you allow this, <laughs> that you allow us into, into this place, Lord, that you allow us into your presence, that you give us this time. It's just an hour each week, but that you give us this time to come together for a purpose to worship you, that you give us this time to draw as close as we can to you. That you call on us to expand this time. To let it, let it drift into every hour of every day of every week. Uh, Lord, we thank you that 
uh, that you're here with us today, that you've allowed your Holy Spirit to come into this place. We need His help leading us as we sing praises to you, Father, as we offer our prayers to you, as we seek to know you more. And so we begin this time of worship, giving you thanks, and we offer it all in Jesus' precious name, amen. Sing some more great songs. Find number 17 in your book. Number 17 is I Stand Amazed in the Presence. The chorus is wonderful. The words, how marvelous, how wonderful. Uh, we're going to sing verses 1 and 2. I Stand Amazed in the Presence. <laughs> Number four, trust and obey. I don't think it'd be camp meeting if we didn't sing that. Trust and obey. We'll sing verses one and five. over one page to number six we'll sing the first verse of near to the heart of God as we move toward our time of prayer number six
we come to our time of prayer uh, this morning, uh, let me offer you the opportunity we've had the last couple of weeks. There are special things that you'd like to live today, uh, those names you'd like to call. Let's do that at this time. Others? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Kate, okay. Yeah, okay. You know, it's interesting. It's not, it's not that we have to call these names. It's just another way, like a lot of the things that we do in a service of worship, Another way that we are intentional about our relationship with God. Another way that we seek to, to draw close to Him. Uh, coming to Him with specific prayer. Coming to Him with bold prayer. Uh, not just uh, sort of the, that lazy prayer, which we tend to fall into a lot of times. When we say, God, just take care of it. Whatever it is, I don't even bother myself with having to think about it. Would you just do it for me? And he will. But I think God really honors that bold prayer. I think he honors that prayer where we come on our face about something very specific. Where we see a need and we, we call on him to step into that need. And so calling these names is part of that. It's not that we have to call every name or mention every situation. It's that we see another opportunity and another way to be intentional about our relationship with Him. Okay? All right. So with, with these names on our heart and there being so many other situations and things which we've not mentioned in here that are also on our heart. Let us take a moment. Davis, uh, David, get us ready. Prepare us. Uh, help us prepare as we step up. Step up. And look up at our Father who is sitting there on a high and holy throne. So would you take a moment and prepare your heart with me. Father, this morning we, uh, we come into your throne room. We come into your presence. Even though you know our very thoughts and you don't need us to, you bid us come closer and closer and step up. Right there. Right there before you. Where we can, we can feel your presence. Where we're as close as we can be. And yet you call us to come even closer, to crawl up in your lap and let you put your arms around us. And we feel your love. Father, we thank you that you always let us in, that you always call us close, that you always draw us near, and that you always love us. 
We come with a lot of things today, Lord. A lot of things on our hearts, things that trouble us. Some of those things, only we know. Us and you. And we need you. About those very things, we need you. We need you to intercede. We need you to break in and give us a solution and give us an answer and help us out of the fix that we're in. We realize that we're there only because we strayed away from you. Only because we tried to blaze our own trail and forge our own path and build our own kingdom. And we plead with you today not to give up on us, but to let us, let us begin again. Knowing that you've already forgiven us. Knowing that your answer is yes. Knowing that you will allow us that chance to begin again. Father, we lift today to you, Laura and John, Daryl, Susie, John, Caroline, Richard. Just the names that we've called out today, the names that we've mentioned today. But there are so many more. Father, if I'd go around this room in this sanctuary, in this holy place and call out the names of every person seated here I lift them all to you asking that you would break into their life in a brand new and a fresh way that they would sense your presence in a way they never have before that they would commit and recommit because in the light of your love that's all that we can do is, is follow, is surrender, is to be everything you have called us to be. We do that after the example of Jesus, that incredible gift that you sent to us. We, th we thank you today, Father, for, for Christ and for his life and his death and his resurrection. We thank you for his many teachings that continue to teach us. It's in keeping with those that we now join our hearts and our voices as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, thank you, Mr. David. You know, you think that's just a nice little transition piece, but it also reminds me it's time for the children's message. Don't go back and sit down. So I appreciate David and how he helps us move around in our worship service. Music adds so much. Well, I wish you could all be with me and sitting here piled around today, but you can't. But we're still going to have just a, a moment of time together. You know, one of the things I really love I love hats. I love hats. You know, I kind of wish we were in a time where men still wore hats to church and other places. Not so much anymore, but, but I was looking at this hat. This hat belonged to my grandfather. And this is a, a felt hat. He always kept two. There was, uh, there was his hat he wore, his everyday hat. And then there was his good hat. He wore his good hat to church. It doesn't fit me quite so good but he uh his head was a little smaller than mine 
but he would wear the good hat to church, and then as the, the everyday hat kind of wore out, the good hat became the everyday hat, and he'd go buy another good hat. You know, that was my grandfather's hat. Here's an interesting little hat. This, this belonged to Rebecca's aunt. I was looking at it this morning, and, and I tried it on and asked Rebecca what she thought. And Miss Rebecca, she really believes in that, that honesty is the best policy all the time and telling the truth all the time. And, and she said, it probably would look better on someone whose head is not as big as a watermelon. <laughs> and that's probably true, don't you think? But that's a, that's a lady's hat. That's a neat little hat. And then I, then I found this hat. This is a really nice hat. It's a hat to keep you warm in the wintertime. Pull it down over your ears like that. You can tie it, you know. It keeps you really, really, really warm. And it's kind of colorful, too. <laughs> so if you're in a crowd, that your family could find you in case they needed to know where you were. That's a fun hat, don't you think? All of these hats are, are very different. They're very different, but, but they're, all, they're all important. You see, the, the man's hat is what a man would wear, and the lady's hat is what a lady would wear. And, and this really fun hat keeps you warm. They all serve kind of a different purpose, but they're all very important. You know, as, I, as, as we start back to school this year, we realize that, that we're different too. You know, we're, we're different. Some can run fast and some can jump high. Some are really good at math and they like that. Some can sing. Some can, can really like English and are good at writing. There's so many things that, that we can do. We're, God has made us all very different, but all for a very important purpose. All very special in His sight. So just always remember, God made me. And even though I'm not like those around me, he made me for a very special purpose because he loves me. Let's take a moment now and let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you that you love us like you do, that you make us all different, but that in that difference, Lord, is a very special purpose for our life. We thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We come now to our time in the service where we would uh, ordinarily pass the plates. You're familiar with that. It's a moment where uh, the plate makes it up and down the row for you to return a portion of the blessings that God has poured into your life. What a small portion he asked. Yeah. If you think about if you think about what scripture tells us about that, we can have conversation and and we will. We can have conversation about how you do the math of all of that. Is it 10%? Is it this? Is it that? We can have that conversation. I'd submit to you it's 100%. That God calls on us to give 100 percent sure you return a portion of those blessings back here to the church to fund the ministries of our church and that's important but in God's call on our lives he said let me have it all not just your money let me have it all your home and your car and your family God have I entrusted my family to you that's a great question for a lot of us to ask have I entrusted my life to you have I made every decision that goes into my life such that I give it back to you? That's what he really calls us to do. So in this time in our service each week, it's a great opportunity for us to think about with just that little bit that we give back how blessed we are, not just in the things that God's given us, but in the opportunity in this moment to worship him in another way. Uh, if you came today prepared to do that, you'll find boxes at the front and the rear of the sanctuary. You can use those to, 
to place your offering there. Uh, I thank you to those of you who are using online giving and also uh, sending those through uh, the postal service. That's working really well. Just remember that this is a time for God, uh, a time for us to, to worship him with our gifts. Would you join me as we, uh, as we pray a blessing over these gifts? Father, we thank you that you bless us with this time, that you bless us in so many ways. Help us to understand what you truly call us to give back to you. Father, as we return a portion of what you've blessed us with for the funding of the ministries of this church, we pray your blessings upon those gifts, that you would take them, that you would multiply them. Father, I pray that you would bless the gifts and the giver using it all for the advancement of your kingdom through the work of our church. And we ask it in Christ's holy name. Amen. I'll just say quickly, you are in for a blessing with the special music today. David Toll is going to sing and play The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power, an Andre Crouch song. I, I, you will be blessed. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches strength from day to day it will never lose its power it soothes my doubts and calms my fears and it dries blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power it reaches to the highest mountain it goes to the lowest valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power, no, it will never lose its power. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you. Going to be in uh, Psalms today. You want to make your way to Psalms, Psalm 67. That's where we'll be. Psalm number 67. It is a psalm whose author is unknown. We know a lot about the author of the psalms. David, of course, penned many, most, perhaps. Uh, this is not one that's attributed to David. Uh, some of your Bibles may actually say a psalm of David, but there's 
most theologians are in agreement that you, this one is hard to, um, to really attribute to David. It's, an, it's a psalm that's often overlooked. If you look at many of the commentaries on the psalms, many, um, many skip this one. They skip the 67th psalm. But I'll tell you that I give thanks today that this psalm was among those lectionary texts assigned for today. And when I read this early in the week, I, I knew we had to do this one. That this psalm was one that we had to talk about today. So I want to ask you, if you would, to join me there at the 67th psalm. I want to ask you to remain seated today as, a, as an intentional act. You say, well, how is that intentional? Because usually we stand, so we're doing something different during camp meeting. I want to ask you to remain seated and let me share with you the 67th psalm. To the leader with stringed instruments, a psalm, a song. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us. That Your way may be known upon the earth. Your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise You, O God. Let all the peoples praise You. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For You judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you O God let all the peoples praise you the earth has yielded its increase God our God has blessed us may God continue to bless us let all the ends of the earth revere him this is the word of God for the people of God thanks be to God so right off the bat in this psalm, right off the bat, we see the psalmist appeal to God for mercy. I don't know how many of you were following along in a, in a King James version. You say, well, wait a second. It, it says in what I read, may God be gracious. May God be gracious to us. This is, this is still a request in this for mercy. As the psalmist begins, this is a request for mercy. Now, let's, we're going to talk about both, so let's take just a moment and talk about the difference between mercy and grace. Sort of different sides of the same coin, but mercy is the withholding of the punishment that we deserve, while grace is the giving of unmerited favor. See the difference? So mercy says, you deserve punishment, but I'm not going to give it. While grace says, and on top of that, let me bless your life. I, I brought this, I wanted to share this with you. Read this not long ago and marked it, and it's really good for us today. This is by Frederick Buchner. Some of you know him, have read some things written by him. At 94, by the way, author, pastor, and at 94, he's continuing to write and preach. Grace is something you can never get, but only be given. There's no way to earn it or deserve it or bring it about any more than you can deserve the taste of raspberries or earn good looks or bring about your own birth. A good night's sleep is grace, and so are good dreams. Most tears are grace. The smell of rain is grace. Somebody loving you is grace. Have you ever tried to love somebody? A crucial eccentricity of the Christian faith is the assertion that people are saved by grace. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to do. The grace of God means something like, here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here's the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Nothing can ever separate us. It's for you I created the universe. I love you. There's only one catch. Like any other gift, the gift of grace can be yours 
only if you reach out and take it. Maybe being able to reach out and take it is a gift too. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. I want to share that with you. kind of helps us understand what this whole idea of grace is. And we see this concept of mercy and grace sort of coexisting, being present at the same time. We see that, don't we, in the, in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see that. Because, because while He stood in there, we got mercy because He got our punishment. He received our punishment. We also see the grace which flows throughout the rest of our life. God withheld the punishment from us. And Jesus gave us, gave us the gift of taking it on Himself. But, but here the psalmist, in the very beginning of this psalm, is seeking after mercy. When you go and you look at the ancient Hebrew, which this was written in, that first word there, you run into this word, Yahaninu, Yahaninu, which means pity, mercy. The psalmist here isn't seeking after the good stuff. The psalmist here is trying to avoid the bad stuff. He's wanting mercy. You might say, I don't, I don't really see that. I don't see that in this translation that I'm reading because this word gracious is used. And this is where the meaning can get a little bit blurred. This is why I, I always recommend to you that if you're really doing Bible study, it's great to consider several different translations of the Bible. Because most that I considered in, in looking at this passage use that word gracious. Gracious. They didn't say anything about mercy. But that word, Yahanenu, is all about mercy. And somehow it's made it into the translations, although not the King James Version. The King James Version, which has a, I struggle with, and, and there are a lot of reasons why. The King James Version said, God be merciful unto us. That's the way it starts out. God be merciful unto us to us you say well how why would these other ones say gracious it's it's the way that word has been interpreted and translated into these texts gracious is not what we think of when we think of mercy gracious is what i say if you invite me to your house for steak and you bring me one and it's hanging off the plate on all sides i look at you and say gracious and that's a common expression but think about what i'm saying I'm saying, what a gift. What a gift. How generous you are in giving me the best and the biggest steak. Gracious. But, but this original language is talking about mercy. God be merciful unto us. So first, he's seeking mercy. We all need mercy, don't we? We all need mercy. The best of the saints and the worst of the sinners all need mercy. But this psalm is important because, because when we receive the mercy, let's don't stop there. Let's don't stop at the mercy. You see, our American response to, to most passages of Scripture and to the message of this text is so programmed to to announce that because of something we did in some church service that we're saved and we, we toss that word around that we're saved because of something we did and so we celebrate our accomplishment because we were so brave to walk down to the front of the church and to pray with the preacher we we see that whole thing that the psalmist is talking about here. We see it as some kind of end point, some kind of conclusion. We have arrived. We have made it. But you see, following this plea for mercy, there's more. Following this plea to save us from this thing that, that would be, we would understand to be eternal damnation, to be hell, following this thing to save us, there is, there's more. And the psalmist makes it clear that there is more. 
we, we see the Aaronic blessing. It's going to be familiar to you. If you go back to Numbers chapter 6, you'll see the blessing there that God told Moses to tell Aaron to give to the people. And it's sort of veilly, it's, it's sort of cloaked here in this psalm, but it's part of what makes up this psalm. And this is it from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Wow. Isn't that the kind of blessing you want? That's the kind of blessing I want. You see, this, this blessing from number 6 is repeated here in this psalm, in this text by the psalmist. But he doesn't stop there. The psalmist doesn't stop at mercy. He goes on to grace and our proper response to the grace in our lives. So, so see, see the movement here. He goes from saying, God, give us mercy, save us. And then he goes to the concept of grace and all that God has done. And then he goes to the proper response to that grace. Verse 2, he offers us the why. Why should we have mercy? Why should we have grace? Why should we receive the blessings that God gives us? And then he gives us the answer so that your ways may be known upon the earth, so that your saving power may be known among all the nations. All the nations. But how can that happen? How can that happen? How can God's ways be known upon the earth? And how can His saving power be known among all the nations? Does this suggest somehow that I might have a role in that? Or that, that you might have a role in that. So God has shown us mercy and, and God has shown us grace and God has, has blessed our lives. What next? The psalmist tells us, praise Him, be glad, sing for joy. He gives us this, this list of verbs, this list of, of action words. He's, he's talking to us. He's saying as believers, here's the proper response. The response, by the way, that should, should come naturally to you. It, it's almost like you don't need it on a list. It's almost like no one should need to prompt you. This should be as natural as breathing. This response should come naturally to you. I was reading this and I was reminded of a course that I took. Um... There was a course when, when the whole study that took place in that had nothing to do with Christianity. It was about other religions. We, we studied the, the methods and the ways of other, other belief systems. We visited two different Buddhist temples and, and listened to the explanation of the the eightfold path that they're called to follow to find God. We, we spent a day at the, the Central Florida Islamic Center. There's a school and a clinic and a lot of other things on this property and, of course, a, a place to worship there at the mosque. And we learned about the five pillars in the Quran. We spent some time uh, studying Hinduism, went to that place of worship as well, and learned about the Vedic traditions which they follow. And in each one of those, what we came to understand is that, that the way that their belief system lays it out is that if you follow these rules, if you will check these boxes, this is how you find God. This is how you can, can go from where you are in this lowly state of existence to find God. This is how you do it. But in understanding who we were not, we came to understand more deeply who we actually are because we stand as Christians so apart from those belief systems because our God came to find us. 
We don't, we don't have to check boxes and rules to go find Him. You see, He came to find us because He wants a relationship with us. Jesus simply said, follow me. That was the message from Jesus Christ. Follow me. That's all He said was, was follow me. And we have taken that, unfortunately, in so many places, in so many places within Christianity. And we've turned it into a set of rules. If you'll check these boxes and do these things, this is how you find God. But that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says we're to have a relationship with Him. That He came looking for us. And all He says is follow me. Follow me. You see, most of, us, most of us tend to stop it, want to stop at mercy. God, just don't let the bad stuff happen. And we stop at mercy. We're okay if God just leave us alone. God, if you'll just make it okay and just leave me alone, I'm good. That's the truth. That's, that's what we do. But you see, that's not, that's not what the psalmist says. That's not the picture that he paints. What he's saying here is that God will use you. He will use you and He'll use me. You know, there's a, this is such a beautiful psalm. What it represents is so beautiful. And out beside it, as we read it, you thought, preacher, you didn't read that little word, Selah. S-E-L-A. You didn't read that little word on the side there, Selah. You skipped over that. I did. I did skip over it. You know, it's, it's really unknown exactly what that means. It's thought that that word Selah was a direction to, uh, to the musicians. That perhaps it was a direction for them in this song to, to pause. To take a momentary pause. And I'm going to tell you, when I read this psalm, I need that Selah. Because when I start to think about the depth of God's love for me, that He would show me mercy, that He would go beyond that, and He would show me the goodness through His grace, I need to pause I need to pause at those places just to take it in. You see, what the psalmist is telling us is that we're blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. I want that. I I, I know you want that too. But he's not just talking about being saved. And I'm not talking about being saved. He's talking about what happens to you when you meet Jesus. Because it's just the beginning. It's not the conclusion. It's not the end. It's not the the place where you have arrived. It is just the beginning. There is no such thing as a lukewarm Christian. No such thing. You cannot follow Jesus sitting down. The way that he taught, the actual way that he taught was to walk and talk the disciples literally followed him they followed after him and so as he's walking along and teaching if you get too far down the path you you can't hear what he says it was an there was a greeting at the time of jesus day much like i might see you on the street and say hey how are you it's, it's a greeting. It's not a, I, I want to know how you're doing, but it's not a real inquiry into everything that's going on in your life. We're both passing each other. How are you? And what are you going to say? Good, how about you? Even if you're not. And even if I'm not. But we offer that, that greeting to each other. There was a greeting in, the, in Jesus' day where they would say, May you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. May you be covered by the dust of your rabbi. And what that seemed to indicate is that that may you walk so closely to your teacher that you would get the dust on you that they kick up as they walk along. Because that's how you learn. That's how you come to be like Jesus. You are either sold out for Jesus Christ or you're not a Christian. You can only be loyal to one king and one kingdom 
To everybody else, you're Judas. You see, this call to to follow, when Jesus says, follow me, it was not an invitation to pray a prayer. It was an invitation, a summons to lose your life in Him. To give it all away for His sake. I have a great friend of mine who who didn't really believe in God or Jesus. And through some, a miraculous set of circumstances, his wife was a believer. And through a miraculous set of circumstances, he, he had an encounter with the true and living God. And he was transformed and, and was sold out for Christ. In midlife, this happened to him. He had amassed quite a bit. He had a great job and he'd done well with his investments. He had a fine home. He had really expensive cars and boats and vacation homes. And he had amassed a a lot of things. And he was forced in that to consider whether these blessings were really blessings in his life or not. And so he told me, he said, I went around to each one of them. And I talked to them. And I asked them. I had conversations with him. And I said, the cars? He said, the cars. I went to the cars and I went to the boats and I went to the vacation homes. And I asked him, how can I use you to tell other people about Jesus? The house and the cars and the boats. He kept some and he sold the rest. How can I use you? To tell others about Jesus. Because if you can't, it's not a blessing. It's something that's going to stand in the way. It's going to get between you and God. You see, what what my friend knew was that he was called to reach others to the ends of the earth. Do you hear in this psalm a veiled reference to the Great Commission? You see, God makes it clear. That we're called to use the blessings in our lives to reach other people. He tells us right there, And make His face shine upon us, that your way may be known upon the earth. Make your face shine upon us. Look favorably upon us. Such that we can reflect to other people the God that we know. Such a reflection is not haughty or selfish or profane or obscene or greedy or unkind or has anything to do with us. That's mercy. But let's not stop at mercy. Let's go on to grace. This week I want to ask you to do something. This week I want you to Read Psalm 67. I've read it to you this morning, so you've got until tonight, because I want you to read it twice a day. I'd like for you to read it in the morning before you start your day, and I'd like for you to read Psalm 67 as you end your day each night. If you got somebody else there in your home with you, maybe you can read it to each other. If you don't, call me. You can read it to me. Read it twice a day for this next week until we come back together, morning and night. Is that a rule? No, it's not a rule. It's not a rule. It's not. It's an encouragement for you to see, recognize, and receive the grace of God. And by week's end, I'm convinced, just as the psalmist wrote, we'll all be singing for joy. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we thank you that Through the words of this psalmist written so long ago, you paint this incredible picture of how you will will extend your mercy to us. How we can be saved because we can't save ourselves. But how that is just the beginning. That we're to take the grace that you shed upon us, the blessings that you pour into our lives, and we're to take them and to to use them as a way to reach others. Father, help us 
to do that. We can only do it with your help. And we offer this prayer to you in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand for the benediction? As we prepare to go out, to leave this holy place, to go out into the world, I read to you again the, num- the, the words from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in His peace. Mm-hmm.